Welcome to the Beyond Ljubljana podcast. I'm your host, Noah Charney. In each episode, we embark on a journey to discover the hidden gems, captivating stories, and unique experiences waiting to be uncovered. Let's get started. Just about any guidebook to Slovenia will have a little box text in the margin that says that Slovenians eat dormice. I've never met a Slovenian who eats dormice. I barely met any who have even heard that they could be eaten in this day and age. I'm sure it was a specialty back in the Middle Ages, and certainly a lot of us have dormice in the eaves of our house or in the crawl space above the attic. But on the lunch menu, I'm not so sure. Um, there is, however, a festival of uh, the tradition of trapping dormice, which is a rich tradition here. And there's a town called Polhov Gradets, um, which could translate as Dormouseville. And it has a cool museum in it. Doesn't sound cool necessarily when I first mentioned that it's the Museum of Post and Telecommunications, but it's very cool and definitely worth a trip. So Polhov Gradets, what's the story behind its name? Why might it be called Dormouseville? Well, there's an official version of the legend that is probably apocryphal as these legends tend to be, but who knows. The story goes that in in olden days, a knight traveled to a small village and he was exhausted and he lay down beneath a weathered beech tree that was covered in moss. And the dormice who are living in and around the beech tree, who are sort of mischievous creatures, I can imagine a great Disney movie about dormice heroes. They couldn't resist and they started gnawing on the straps on the knight's saddle. And they gnawed through them. And when he woke up, he saw the bite marks and he immediately knew that it was dormice behind it. And he got angry. And as you do as a knight in the Middle Ages, he grumbled, dormice, you naughty troublemakers. This is not Graditz, it's Porhov Graditz. So this isn't the town of, you know, town, but it's dormice town. And that's how it got its name. I think we could probably invent a better story ourselves, but that's the one that I was told when I visited. It remains lost to the mists of time whether he ate the dormice in retaliation, but I'm going to guess he didn't, and he went out for a schnitzel instead. So whatever you're interested in, in terms of lunch, I can definitely recommend the Museum of Post and Telecommunications. I think it needs a new title because that sounds a little bit dry, but in fact, it's interesting to know how did humans communicate throughout history. You may find yourself in Slovenia in the outskirts of Ljubljana, but the methods were essentially pan-European. And this museum goes through all the ways that people communicated with a focus on the 20th century, but going back much further than that. Let me start by saying the location is beautiful. It's a castle straight out of a fairy tale. And then you go inside and the museum has this collection of artifacts from antique postal equipment to, you know, telegraphs and early telephones. And what's cool is that most of the, I want to say gadgets or technology there still works. And a lot of it you can try out yourself. You can also sign up for workshops that are much more interactive, but a lot of it is hands-on. So you can learn about, you know, how we communicate from the development of mail delivery systems to Morse code to the internet. And if you're into philately, which is stamp collecting, so you don't get any funny ideas, then there's a great display of postage stamps here. It's got this special room that's a historical post office. And one of the cool things is that you can have workshops or engage in interactive demonstrations there that let you essentially play the role of an early 20th century postman. Um, you can try out electrical, optical, and acoustic tools for sending information. There were all sorts of ways that people communicated before the, you know, the ubiquity of text messages and emails. And if you are not sufficiently entertained at that point, or I'll put it this way, I was sufficiently entertained at that point, but it gets even better. Um, outside, there's the Dormouse Adventure Park, and that's a path that runs 1,300 meters into the woods around the manor house of Porto Gradet. And it's a light hike, which is good. It probably takes about two hours, especially if you're going with kids. But what's good is it's dotted with activities for kids along the way. This includes things like um, uh, a badger's den that you can look into, some points where you can see wildlife. And a post office for animals. I'll let you imagine what that looks like. So if you're there with kids, then this is a great thing to add to your itinerary. So the Postal Museum is an extension of the very large Technical Museum of Slovenia, which is in the town of Bistra, 
near the larger settlement Vrnica, which is about 10 minutes away from the center of Ljubljana. Technical Museum is housed in this enormous fortified complex that was once a Carthusian monastery. And I went there for the first time with my kids and with a buddy of mine who also brought his kids. And we weren't sure how exciting it was going to be for them. And it turned out it was a great, very full day out. Why very full? Well, it is huge. It's got 6,000 square meters of space. So you're going to easily get in your 10,000 steps and then some, especially if you have little kids running around excited to go from one room to the next. And man, has it got a diverse array of exhibits. So everything from vintage cars, carriages, bicycles, motorcycles. Okay, but also how about aircraft? farming machinery, scientific tools. You know, if you've got a gearhead in the family, this is the place for them. But it's also got things like natural history specimens, early computers and televisions, hunting and fishing exhibitions, woodwork, textiles, electricity, printmaking, metalworking, even forestry. So the impression it gives is, you know, the kind of kooky uncle who has a lot of things in his attic that he's been saving. Well, imagine that attic on steroids stretching out to 6,000 square meters in a medieval monastery and with really useful interactive exhibitions and great wall copy that explains why things look the way they do and the story behind the objects. It's really a fun day out, and it's especially fun if you have kids with you. Um, there's a very good restaurant next to it, and you can eat there, or if you have a nice day on your hands, you bring a picnic and sit and have a picnic lunch on the extensive grounds. You can easily spend a full day here, and I will certainly be back. I kept you waiting in suspense, didn't I, for this Domjale Straw Hat Museum. Just how exciting can it be? Well, let me tell you. So I live right near Domjale, and I'd never heard of this museum. But one year, I was honored to be invited as the guest of honor at the annual Domjale Straw Hat Festival. And I started getting interested in straw hats all of a sudden because I thought this was a pretty cool honor. And one of the first things they did was bring me to the museum where I was fitted for my very own bespoke straw hat. And the museum itself, I was immediately taken with. One thing that's cool about it is you walk right in and there's this enormous painting that's actually on a curtain that was once used um, as the curtain in a performance space that is a spectacular painting of different aspects of Yugoslav cultural life. This is a painting that is of such high quality and such interest that it should really be in a museum, but it's housed a little bit randomly in this straw hat museum. And I found myself staring at that before I even got to the straw hat parts. But then you get to the story of the town of Dumjale, which is only a 20 minute ride from Ljubljana by train, even less time by car. And the exhibit is really the story of the town, which was once much more important than we realized. And by we, I mean me and my, you know, daughters who were less than eight years old then. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have known. Anyway, but here's the thing. Domjale was the international headquarters for straw hats. Why is that a big deal? Well, if you think back on it prior to the Second World War, Every man wore a hat all the time when they were outside. And in the summer, you don't want to wear a hat that's too warm. That's why straw hats are the good thing to turn to. So this was pretty ubiquitous, just like people put on, you know, shoes and socks and a jacket or an umbrella when it rains, you put on a hat. So straw hats actually originated, as far as we know, as a technique developed around Renaissance Florence. But the story goes that there was a, I guess, Florentine traveler who was wandering this part of the world. And he arrived near Domjale and he didn't have any money with him. And for price of a meal and a place to stay, he said, how about I give you this knowledge that I brought with me about how to make hats out of straw? And he taught the locals and it became an industry. So how is it done? Well, first you need a lot of fields of wheat and you have straw from these wheat fields used to produce hats and baskets and other dry goods. So you set aside the straw to dry, and then it would be kept until the winter months or in bad weather, and then families would get together, and they're hanging out, and you know there isn't that much to do, nothing on Netflix 200 years ago. So they wind up braiding straw, 
And the straw braids that you use so that they essentially become threads that you can weave are called butarice. And these are what would be sewn into the hat. So you start with the straw, but the straw itself is brittle. So you have to basically braid the straw together into um, material that's strong enough for you to sew into hats. The woven braids were sometimes made into hats at home, and the families would earn extra money by selling them at market. Or sometimes they would be sold to local factories or dealers that would then make them. So the thing that the families made at home was the braids. And some families actually made them into hats. Some just sold the braids to local factories to be made into hats. And in the late 19th century, some of the wealthier Habsburg merchant families, uh, most of them Austrian or German, moved to Domjane. They married the local wives and they set up some factories for making straw hats. Now, if we go back to around 1900, this is, you know, prime time for hat makers. There were 25 straw hat factories in tiny Domjale, and there were a thousand people employed. Now, that's big because Domjale wasn't much more than a village at the time. The town population circa 1856 was 1,126. And by 1920, it was 2,156. And those were extra thousand people were straw hat makers. The factories, believe it or not, produced around a million straw hats a year. And get this, their subsidiary factories, subsidiary Tom Domjare Slovenia, opened up in Vienna, Budapest, Bucharest, Prague, Florence, and even New York City. So, in fact, I can't remember the date. Dates aren't that important. I'm a history professor, and I'll tell you right off the bat, dates aren't that important. So it's at some point around this time, 390 residents of Domjare moved to America. And they'd been headhunted because they were the straw hat ninjas and they were brought in to teach American factory workers how to make straw hats. And most of them were women from Domjale. And they were teaching these Americans how to sew butarice, which I think is just a great image. The last factory, Universale, closed down, only closed in 2003. And it had been in business for 130 years. So there was about a century where Domjale was a big center for one industry in particular, a very specific one. And now it's just a boutique art form practiced by a few enthusiastic locals, and they have the Straw Hat Festival. It's the symbol of the town of Domjale, um, but it really was the place to be. And this small museum, um, it's got interactive exhibits where you can um, grade your own butarice. You can see all the aspects of the process, and it's really much more interesting and interactive than you think it would be. And the story really surprised me that Little Domjane was on the world map for about a century because of this very specific local tradition. Now, whether you're into engineering, the postal system, or straw hats, and who isn't really, the Greater Ljubljana region has a museum for you. And they are far more interesting than they sound at first. They'll make for a memorable half-day trip from Slovenia's capital. This has been an episode of the Beyond Ljubljana podcast, brought to you by Ljubljana Tourism.